Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 Fireside Chat for the Environmental Law Section Lifetime Achievement Award. My name is Peter Tan. This is Marilee Hansen and Mark Lusebrink. We are uh, part of the subcommittee that organizes this event. We're so honored today to honor the life and career of Rick Frank. Um, with us today, we have two of his longtime friends and colleagues, Matt Rodriguez and Shannon Morrissey. Marilee's going to tell you a little bit more about our speakers. Shannon was a student of Rick's at UC Davis King Hall of Law and remains a good friend of his. She's an attorney at Wilmer Hale in San Francisco where she practices environmental and public resources law. Matt is also a really good friend of Rick's and they were longtime colleagues at the Attorney General's office. Matt recently retired from there where he held the highest position in that office, which is titled the Assistant Attorney General. He's also a former secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency. Just to note, this talk will last about 30 minutes and we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. Um, so that's what your comment cards are for. Please fill them out. Mark will be collecting and sorting them and making sure the interviewers get them so we can final, uh, end the chat with your questions. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt and Shannon. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I'll just start off by saying that uh, I first started working with uh, Rick. We were both in the land law section in 1987. Um, and this is before the internet. Um, this is before uh, you know, printers, you had to type out everything. And so I first got to know Rick um, because decisions would come down. And in those days, the decision would go to the library uh, because the courts would mail it to the library or send it to the library or you'd see them in the newspaper. Um, and it seemed like three days after a decision would come out, I would get this memo from this Rick Frank, who's just another deputy in the office, telling me about this new case that had come out. Uh, it was a very important case. It would do an analysis. It would be a very lengthy analysis. And it would tell me the three key points that I needed to know about this case. And I would ask myself, how does he have the time to do this? <laughs> Is he going into the library and stealing the newspapers in the morning so he has the first uh, crack at these uh, cases? Um, and why does he think I need to have continuing education? Is there something that he sees and knows that I don't? Um, but then I would get a call from a client, and they would say, do you know about this new case? And I would say, well, yeah, actually, we've been discussing it within the office. And uh, <laughs> I think there are three key points that you need to know about in this case. <clears throat> and, and it was at that point that I realized that, you know, if I just followed Rick for the rest of my career, I would be in good shape. Um, and I think that many of us sitting here today uh, have benefited from his guidance, his support, his insights. And so that's why it's especially uh, pleasurable for me to be here today and to be able to honor him and, you know, uh, and uh, receiving the recognition that I think he deserves for just a great lifetime of achievements in environmental law. But starting with that, um, you were a political science major and you were minoring, I think, in English at uh, Santa Barbara. Why should I have believed anything you knew or said about environmental law? And how did you get started on environmental law? Well, um, I was at the right place at, at the right time, in a sense. I was at Santa Barbara from 1967, graduated in 71. For those of you who know your California environmental history, uh, in January of 1969, we had the worst oil spill then in the United States history. Uh, an offshore oil platform in Federal Waters off of uh, Isla Vista in Santa Barbara uh, blew out and, and caused a massive amount of oil uh, to, to befoul the ocean waters and eventually came onto the coast and, and, and uh, uh, contaminated the beaches. A lot of seabirds were killed, a lot of marine mammals. And uh, I lived uh, right on an apartment right on uh, next to the beach. So I saw, I was a personal witness to uh, what was going on. And what struck me immediately was that nobody had a clue what to do, how to clean up. There, there was no oil spill uh, response technology. There was no government 
organized or private effort. It was uh, really sad and alarming, but obviously that brought front and center to me the consequences of, of uh, industrialization and development and, uh, and the, the impacts of that. So that was, in four years of education at UC Santa Barbara, probably the most uh, enlightening educational moment was in January uh, of 1969 when that happened. And, um, there was a, a silver lining to that in addition to all the wake-up calls and the, and the federal and state governments and local governments beginning to think about emergency response and what needed to be done. Um, UC Santa Barbara, my alma mater, was the first university and first campus in the uh, uh, in, in the nation uh, to create out of whole cloth an environmental studies program and an environmental There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was too late for me to change my major. I would have changed it in a heartbeat. Uh, but in my senior year um, at UC Santa Barbara, I was able to take environmental history from Roderick Nash, who was the leading national expert. I took a course in human ecology from Garrett Hardin, uh, who wrote the Tragedy of the Commons, which any of you who have worked in environmental law, science, or policy, or economics have, have read and treasured, and, and several other courses. So while I had this kind of unformed idea in, in college as a, that maybe I should be a lawyer when I, when I got to that point, that that would be the career path, it was that experience in my last year and a half uh, at UC Santa Barbara that really got me laser focused on, this is what I want to do. I want to become a lawyer and I want to work on these issues that uh, clearly need so much work. And then, uh, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. I mean, that, that, that uh, Santa Barbara oil spill, along with the fire on the Cuyahoga River uh, in downtown Cleveland and, and Rachel Springs publication of, of uh, a publication of Silent Spring earlier in the 60s uh, were all formative moments which catalyzed the start of the modern environmental movement with you know everything that we're studying here and discussing and debating uh, here today and we've been for 32 years at the Yosemite conference so long answer to your question but that's that's what got me passionate about it and I came to law school uh, at UC Davis in 1971 uh, again, at, the, at that point, I knew what I wanted to do, why I wanted to get a law degree, and how I wanted to devote my career, and uh, uh, it's worked out okay. <laughs> More than okay. Uh, how'd you wind up at the Attorney General's office? I was uh, a second-year law student at King Hall, UC Davis, and uh, I was looking for an opportunity to learn a little bit about the actual practice of law as opposed to just sitting in a classroom. Um, and I forgot the detail, I forgot the details, but I, uh, I learned of a position in the California Attorney General's office in Sacramento in the then uh, public, uh, it, was, it had a different name, the public rights uh, division, I've forgotten what it is, <laughs> uh, but in the consumer law section, not in environment. Um, and so I, I went there and I worked there starting about midway in my 2L year and throughout the end of my 3L year. Uh, and I fell in love with the office uh, before I ever got out of law school. I just, I looked around, I saw the people, I saw the culture. Uh, it seemed like a very benevolent uh, uh, environment. A lot of scary bright people committed to public service. Uh, I had immediately two, two mentors. Uh, uh, Peter DeMauro, who was my immediate job boss in the uh, consumer law section, and Jan Stevens, who many of you know, who, who has been my mentor, continues to be my mentor uh, some 50 years later. And uh, uh, he saw something in me that I never saw. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it really grateful. So he was the first person, and he kept an eye on me. Mm -hmm. And after, in those days, you didn't get into the attorney general's office, or at least the public rights division, right out of law school. You had to get trained either somewhere else in the criminal division, handling appellate cases in the criminal division, or somewhere else, uh, and then be brought in. And uh, so I worked in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years for the precursor to the Department of Energy. Uh, uh, in the wake of the Arab oil embargo, I came back to California and was one of the first lawyers working for the California Energy Commission for a year and a half. But Jan Stevens was behind all that. He knew people in Sacramento and he was putting in a good word for me. And then when he 
became leader in Sacramento, at least, of the uh, land law section in Sacramento, and he was asked to recruit a team. Uh, he reached out to me and plucked me out of the Energy Commission and got me to the AG's office, and uh, I've spent a delightful 31 years there. Well, speaking of that, near 31 years, you worked, you know, as you said, in consumer land law, government law section. You were an intern, you were a deputy, you were a supervising deputy, you were a senior assistant uh, attorney general, uh, more than once, I think. You were the chief assistant uh, AG. You were uh, the chief deputy AG. Clearly, you were one of those state civil servants that they wanted to move you around and uh, uh, you couldn't stay in one job for a period of time, but they couldn't fire you, so they had to keep moving you. Uh, <clears throat> but looking back on that uh, period of time, um, you know, what do you, what do you see as your significant achievements or your fondest memories of being in the AG's office? Well, so some of the fondest memories are what I said before. The in people that I got to work with, the extraordinarily talented, committed people that I got to work with, work for, work with, and supervise, and uh, eventually mentor myself and the people who are uh, still there doing good uh, and great work. So uh, that's, that's part of it. Um, in terms of the legal uh, stuff, and, and Matt already knows the answer to this question, I guess the two areas uh, that I focused most of my work in the land law section as a line deputy uh, was on property rights, uh, particularly regulatory takings law, uh, there were, it seemed like the U.S. Supreme Court in the 80s and early 90s were, were issuing one or two regulatory takings cases a year. There was plenty of action in the lower courts. And I, I, frankly, I don't know exactly how I wandered into that particular niche of, uh, 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 of environmental law, but I spent a lot of time uh, writing, uh, arguing cases, writing briefs, and uh, I had a particularly proud moment. I see Peter Lehner is here, from the, then from the New York Attorney General's office. Uh, I was writing a, I, I had the opportunity to write amicus briefs uh, are on regulatory takings issue, uh, issues at a time uh, for the Supreme Court at a time when the court was clearly making things up as it went along through crafting this doctrine uh, of regulatory takings. And I remember those were different days, not nonpartisan days, and I was writing briefs that were signed on by 46 or 48 attorneys general from both political parties and filing those cases, uh, those briefs in the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, so I, and writing a lot about, not just to my colleagues, but in professional journals and law review articles, I started to write about, about that. So uh, for better or worse, and probably for worse, the way the law of regulatory takings has evolved in my, in my, from my perspective, uh, you know, had some role in shaping or, or fending off uh, 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 aspects of uh, regulatory takings doctrine, but that's been really interesting, and, and that's an, one of the areas, both as uh, as a lawyer and then as an academic, as a professor, uh, another area that I've really grown to really be passionate about is this intersection of environmental law, environmental slash natural resources law, and constitutional law that we've talked a lot about at this conference. Uh, today, and that's becoming, I think, the constitu constitutionalization of environmental law is, is really uh, a key trend right now and has been for years in environmental law. So I did that. The other, the other area, and I'll be much briefer, uh, is the public trust doctrine, which, again, mm -hmm. Jan Stevens and, and Gregory Taylor and other my mentors and, and supervisors in the Attorney General's office, uh, they really conceptualized and planned a, a strategic strategy of litigation, working with clients and working in the Attorney General's independent capacity to take this doctrine. Uh, we had a, a seminal law review article by Joe Sachs <coughs> uh, uh, talking about how that should be a cornerstone of modern environmental law. Uh, the California Supreme Court uh, agreed with that and we developed a whole line of cases uh, and a strategy uh, uh, to uh, advance the public trust doctrine in a natural resource preservation environmental protection uh, context. Now I got to do a lot of work on that. Uh, I got to argue cases in the courts of, courts of appeal and the, the California Supreme Court on that uh, and, and again wrote probably too much in my spare time uh, in law review articles and what have you but uh, that, that's another area where and even today I continue to work on and do some pro bono litigation to try and help craft and, and move and expand the doctrine of the public trust doctrine as a doctrine of 
uh, natural resource preservation. Well, I'll let Shannon talk to you about your next uh, career after the AG's office and you know uh, how you came to move from the AG's office. But any final thoughts? What do you advise people, uh, students or uh, attorneys today who are thinking about going to the AG's office? Yeah. I think it's a wonder, it, it was a wonderful place for the 31 years that I was there. I see people, call it my former colleagues who are still there nodding. Uh, it's a special place. It's a special place. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the culture is great. Uh, the working conditions are great. And, and I still uh, marvel at the fact that I was able to get up and say, I'm, I'm, may it please the court, I'm uh, blankety, I'm Rick Frank, uh, California Department of Justice, representing the California Air Resources Board or the, or the California Coastal Commission. Or, and this is the most mind blowing thing, uh, I'm here representing the people of, uh, people of the state of California. And that's, that's an awesome responsibility. That's a tremendous opportunity. And uh, uh, that, that's very special. So uh, it's a unique office. You can, you can do that with the US Department of Justice, with the county council's office, with the district attorney. It doesn't have to be environmental law necessarily. But, but the key, I'll, I'll leverage your, your question. Uh, what I tell my students is you know, find something, an area of the law that you're passionate about. Uh, find a place to practice uh, where, uh, with people that you respect and uh, that you will enjoy working with, and uh, uh, that's the most important thing. Life is too short to spend a third or a half of your waking hours uh, doing something that you don't like, that you don't feel passionate about. So, and, and virtually everybody I worked with over my 31 years in the Attorney General's office uh, felt passionate about what they were doing and uh, were glad they were working where they were. Shannon. Great. Mm -hmm. Am I on? You are. I'm on. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Shannon Morrissey. I work at Wilmer Hale in San Francisco. And Rick, can I just start and say that it's such an honor and I'm so delighted to be the one up here getting to ask you questions. So thanks very much for inviting me and for having me. And I am certain that I am um, the subject of some envy of some of your other former law school classmates whom I told about this and um, did some peer reviewing to repair these remarks. Um, so I hope I get to do you, your academic career on top of the 31 year attorney general career some justice. Um, before I start grilling you, am I out? I'm back. Um, before I start grilling you on your academic career, though, Rick, I hope you don't mind if I share a story um, about Rick or Professor Frank to me um, from 2012 to 2015. So in my second year of law school, I took an environmental practice course with Professor Frank, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's a course on what it is like to practice environmental law. In that class, for example, I learned how to conduct negotiations with agencies. And now in my career, I conduct negotiations with agencies, real agencies, real clients. So thank you so much for that um, experience where I had a lot of room to, to make mistakes. So at the end of that course, just before the holiday break, Rick invited his entire class, my entire class, over to his home in Sacramento to have a meal and a drink. And he literally opened up his home to us. And I remember so vividly, vividly meeting Rick's lovely wife, who's down here, Connie, and your golden retriever at the time. And at the time, I was still adjusting to living about 3,000 miles away from my family, who live in Florida. So it was just a really heartwarming experience to be invited into somebody's home. And that, I don't think, happened to me again in law school. So that memory is really stuck with me. And I think it's emblematic of you, Rick, as a person. You care about the people. And you've always wanted to ensure that everyone feels included and that you have a, they have a seat at the table. So I think that's really been a, a big part of the career from what I've seen and heard anyways. So on that note, you've been in academia now nearly 20 years. You're currently a professor of environmental practice at UC Davis's King Hall School of Law, my alma mater. And you are director of the California Environmental Law and Policy Center at UC Davis. Before this, you served as the executive director of the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment at UC Berkeley. So tell us about the career shift from attorney general to academia. Well, it was, it was a very easy and gradual shift, actually, because I've actually been teaching uh, uh, a teacher uh, for going back to 1978, uh, when I was just starting my career as a practicing attorney. I, w I served as an adjunct professor initially 
teaching at undergraduate and non-law graduate students at UC Davis in what was then the Division of Environmental Studies, an undergraduate course on environmental law. Did that for a few years. I went to Lincoln Law School, a night school in Sacramento, and taught civil procedure there for about uh, uh, 15 years. Uh, and uh, that was a lot of fun, actually, because students uh, uh, come into that class with such low in expectations as to how in interesting it can be. <laughs> it's not hard to, uh, to, to, to spice it up a little bit with real world experiences. So, uh, and I taught environmental law and, and negotiations and alternative dispute resolution there. Uh, I later taught as an adjunct when I was still practicing at the Attorney General's office at UC Davis at the law school uh, at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, I, I was formulated a course in California environmental law. I think it was the first one that was put together. Uh, taught that at UC Berkeley uh, uh, after I became a full-time academic in 2006. Um, and, uh, uh, and a couple of other uh, institutions as well. Uh, but so an, as an adjunct, uh, in addition to my day practice, daily practice uh, from 78 to uh, uh, 2006, and then a full-time academic uh, for about the last 17 years now, 18 years. So I think the theme here is, how do we get your energy, Rick? <laughs> <laughs> no, that wasn't really a question, but we are, somehow we're... I can say it was a diet Pepsi. Yeah. <laughs> breakfast <laughs> breakfast yeah, of yeah. champions. This yeah. is not a diet Pepsi ad, yeah. but <laughs> we could be sponsored. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are, of course, as we expected, running a little bit short of time, and I want to make sure we have some time for audience questions. So I'll just ask you one or two more questions, and we'll try to be quick with it. So as a professor, you regularly brought practitioners and experts into the classroom to make it clear that you must have collaboration between the environmental policy folks, the lawyers, researchers, scientists, engineers from the beginning. Why is being collaborative necessary to achieve success on environmental issues? Give us an example. Well, as most of the people who are here in attendance who practice environmental law know full well, uh, environmental lawyers can't, literally can't do it on their own. To be effective in the courtroom or counseling clients, you have to know what you're talking about. You have to know uh, environmental science, uh, environmental economics, uh, uh, aspects of business law. Um, so, uh, but look, looking at that positively, uh, I've had an opportunity to have a lifetime postgraduate education in so many disciplines. Uh, and I'm sure that's true of a lot of people that are here. Uh, so you need that uh, to reach out and that collaboration with your consultants, your expert witnesses, the technical people from the agencies you represent, whether it's the Air Resources Board or the Water Board or the Coastal Commission. Uh, so that's, that's really important. But um, beyond that, there's another type of collaboration, and that is uh, sometimes with your litigation opponents. You, you have to vigorously uh, uh, advocate on behalf of your clients in litigation. But many of the people uh, opposing counsel in the cases that I've handled have become friends. And uh, at events like this, the Yosemite Conference, or uh, friendships have just been forged there. I, ha I have friends in the Pacific Legal Foundation who I met uh, litigating against them, hammer and tong. But, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, very bright, good, uh, people who are who are doing this work uh, uh, passionately and effectively from uh, so so it's collaboration in that sense as well and to uh, put together panels and bring a diversity of views uh, is uh, is something I like doing and I think it's to come back to your question I think it's it's important as a teacher uh, to expose my students to a variety of views of viewpoints and orientation and disciplines so I. I Yes, I, I, I thought that was important then. I continue to believe it's important to bring a lot of different views and areas of expertise into the classroom and my teaching. Um, you should do a course for Congress next. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so what about, are you, I'll ask you one more question and then let's shift to, to audience. I think we're getting to that time and I'm sure you all have a bunch of questions. So are you able to pursue or support legal causes that you're passionate about currently in your role? How do you do that? Give us an example. Well, I've, uh, uh, as I've limited, I've slowed my, down my teaching. I'm teaching now one semester a year as opposed to uh, full time. Um, and I now live on the Central Coast. And, and as part to sink deeper roots into my adopted community and also uh, to do just that, to try and uh, move away from the practice of law to do other things, I, I serve on a, 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 a conservancy, the Santa Lucia Conservancy Board of Trustees. 
uh, which is a beautiful property that backs up onto Big Sur, 20,000 acres, which the Conservancy holds and manages. I'm actually board chair, and I just recently joined uh, the board of directors of the Monterey Waterkeeper organization. So uh, I'm, wor I'm working with two nonprofits now. I continue to do, I love working uh, and collaborating with my colleagues in the section on section programs, uh, give talks to training to uh, uh, judges on water law and CEQA uh, through the Judicial Council. So uh, I do, those are all things I do to keep busy and, and kind of stretch myself a little bit. Still the energy. <laughs> So um, I'll let you choose from these two. Let me okay. ask this question. Uh, Rick, where do you see um, environmental law heading? Uh, will we continue to see new laws and new issues? Well, I think so, and I hope so. I mean, uh, uh, I was very fortunate to be there in law school in the start of my career in the 1970s, which was the, the decade in which the, the foundation of, of modern environmental law, both at the national level and in California with CEQA and, and, and the Coastal Act and a number of other things, uh, 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 you know, were created. Uh, there have been a lot of developments since then, but it, those old laws, uh, as we're all learning, are, are not, uh, uh, not totally a good fit for a lot of the environmental problems we have now, most prominently uh, climate change. Uh, so uh, California has, of course, been a national world leader in, in trying to uh, uh, pioneer effective strategies. So I think I'd love to see a national climate legislation that replicates and maybe even moves beyond what California has done with AB 32 and other uh, laws to uh, uh, tackle greenhouse gas emissions and promote adaptation strategies. But uh, uh, we need uh, the next generation of lawyers to keep pushing and be creative and not simply rely on applying uh, or advocating for or against the existing laws on the books. As good as they are and effective they've been, uh, there's, a, there's an obsolescence that comes uh, and uh, we need the next generation of environmental lawyers to contemporize uh, a lot of laws that are becoming a little bit old, a little wrinkled, a little old, and some totally antiquated. Great. Um, so I'll input one more question of mine and then I'll go to this question selfishly since I have the mic. Um, so, but I think it goes to this, to, to what you were just speaking to, Rick. So you, I, since I've known you, you've always been committed to passing on your knowledge and your professional contacts to ensure that the next generation of lawyers is not only educated on the law, but able to understand how the law works in practice. And as I already mentioned, to see what a day in the life of, a, of an environmental lawyer looks like. Um, in government and private practice and the public service sector as well. So you've mentored and inspired dozens, if not hundreds, of law students to per pursue a career in environmental law. And if we um, took a poll here, I'm certain that most folks in the audience would raise their hand and say that you've impacted their career in some way. So can you speak to the importance of mentorship in environmental law and why do you continue to make time to mentor both your students your, current, your prior students, your colleagues, your prior colleagues? I, it's hugely important to me and, and I hope to, to many of you. I mean, I, I would not have had the career that I had uh, without strong mentors and effective mentors who really cared about me and stuck with me. Uh, and as I said before, uh, you know, saw things in me that I never saw in myself. Uh, so uh, both as a supervisor and, and eventually leading the, the office uh, of the Attorney General and now uh, as a law professor, I, I very much feel the need to pay it forward. And it's not a hard lift because I very much, I, I enjoy mentoring students like you and, uh, and the many others who are here today and uh, the others at Berkeley and uh, at Davis that I've uh, encountered in my classes and elsewhere uh, as an academic. So uh, I, I think it's a worthwhile tradition. It's one of the most satisfying things I've done in my career. And I'm so grateful for the folks who mentored me. Great. Uh, a couple of other questions have come in. Um, so let me ask this one. As uh, This comes from one of your uh, former clients. Um, and uh, they marveled at uh, uh, your ability to continue to be optimistic. Um, and they were wondering, uh, you know, what, what is the secret for your optimism <laughs> in the face of some unfavorable court decisions, especially recently? Well, it's, it's, a, it's 
what's the alternative? <laughs> Gloom and doom? I mean, and you're just going to crawl into your hole or, or to mix metaphor, pull the blankets over your head and, yeah. uh, and huddle? Uh, no, you've got to keep moving forward. And uh, I think we all, as human beings, have a habit of, uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, focusing uh, on the negative as opposed to and taking a lot of the positive uh, for granted. So I, I try not to do that. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of good in the world. Uh, and, and to tie it back directly to this conference, I never feel more inspired and more optimistic than I do after four days at this conference. And I've been coming to this conference since its inception uh, in, you know, 30, 31 years ago. So uh, uh, it's not that hard. Uh, and, and we're all doing work that we're passionate about and we love. Uh, and whether it's as a lawyer, as an engineer, or a planner, or a scientist, uh, it's, it's, it's a great profession or set of professions that we've chosen. Um, here's a tough one. What do you think of the great leap in capital letters backward being taken by the Supreme Court of the United States? How will it affect the public trust? on a positive topic. Well, uh, then, <laughs> I don't think it will affect the public trust much, uh, actually, what the Supreme Court does or what federal courts do, because we have the PPL Montana case, which said, much to my chagrin, uh, that there is no federal law of public trust, and it's purely a state court doctrine. I, I despaired at that temporarily uh, at the time. Uh, but in hindsight, that's, that's actually pretty good news. And California can continue to lead the nation in evolving and applying and benefiting from the public trust doctrine along with the, uh, uh, a lot of other states. So uh, I'm not, that's one area of the environmental law that I'm in particular not worried about uh, a potential uh, uh, conservative presidential administration or uh, a skeptical or hostile set of federal courts uh, uh, tampering with. That's, it's much more of an issue, I think, with other statutes and other, other, other doctrines. Mm -hmm. I'll mix in one of these questions with a question that I had, and that is, you know, looking back, I mean, I've always described you as having what appears to the rest of us to be the perfect career, uh, success as a litigator, success in academia. Uh, you've affected the lives of so many people. Any regrets, any things that you would think that you would have done differently uh, looking back on it? Um, to us, it seems perfect. <laughs> This may sound naive or, or implausible, uh, nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I've just, and I, I, it, it's, it's <laughs> luck. I've been so fortunate uh, to do this. And uh, I've told my, my family this, and I've told other people this. Uh, I, I, and as hokey as it sounds, it's absolutely true. I've never had a day, either in, as, a, as a practicing attorney or as an academic, that I haven't looked forward to going to work. And that's absolutely true. On the other hand, um, <laughs> yes, Mr. Downer. <laughs> None of us can live up no. to that. Yeah. Surely there must have been those moments when you wake up at 3.30 in the morning and go, why did I answer the question in that way? Um, uh, any, any disappointments, any things that you look back on and say, oh, I wish that had worked out differently? No, I mean, I, the, I, you know, I wish I had had a 100% litigation success rate, and I didn't. But, uh, but I, you know, I won more cases than I lost. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think I ever st stuck my foot in it, so to speak, in oral argument or, uh, or either in trial or in appellate argument, so uh, hopefully it didn't, do, didn't embarrass any clients or, 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 uh, or, or other folks. Uh, and uh, no, I, I, like I say, I think uh, not too many times I woke up at 3.30 in the morning. The, the bigger thing at 3.30 in the morning, and my wife has been very, Connie has been very accommodating in my career in the demand. Uh, at 3.30 in the morning, I might be up writing an appellate brief or clearing my desk at the, at the attorney general's office in order so that I could go with my family on a vacation with a clear desk and a clear conscience. I, I did not mention the no-dos, um, but uh, yeah, 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 I know no-dos and, and Diet Pepsi were a big part of yeah. energizing you through the years. Um, Guilty as charged. <laughs> Do you have another question? I do have another question. So this question is uh, from the audience. As we pass the roughly 50-year milestone of the passage of the major environmental laws, what do you see, if anything, as the pivotal milestone 
during this period, over the past 50 years? Easy question. And where do you see things going? Hmm. <laughs> the pivotal issue. I mean, it has been a 20-ring circus in the, the <laughs> law that we practice, so it's hard for me to say over 50 years and in all these different uh, subject areas and doctrines and statutes, uh, pivotal ones. I think it has been a, a building process and a, a, a creative uh, accretion of, uh, of principles, mostly for the good uh, and mo mostly for refinement. Uh, again, I, I think where things go forward, uh, and there's some great successes. We saw some of them here uh, on, on Friday. I mean, uh, Native Americans, uh, a very sorry history of, of national and state governments and their treatment of Native Americans who preceded us. But it's uh, just reading John Leshy's book that I'm going to talk about with him tomorrow on a panel. I mean, uh, Native Americans and their rights and their, uh, their talents in terms of environmental protection uh, are they're gain, gaining much more influence now, and there's a lot that that uh, that we can learn from and benefit from, in partnering with them going forward. So that that's a, a very welcome trend and change uh, in recent years. Uh, the, the 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 tough nut to crack, I think, is climate change, and both on the uh, climate change mitigation front and the climate change adaptation uh, front, which are both. Uh, uh, both principles and initiatives that we have to tackle full four square. They're not mutually exclusive uh, and we shouldn't uh, take one over the other because we have to do both to save this planet of ours in my humble opinion. I think that's right. And so I don't think we've asked this, I'm not sure. Okay, it's on. Um, I don't think we've asked this directly, Rick, but you've mentioned a lot of high points in your career, but is there, when we prep um, for this this evening, you talked about a few examples in your career of uh, particular points of pride or something you were really excited about or look back on um, a big win. I remember you mentioning John Roberts in, in one of those oh, yeah. cases. Could you share for sure. the audience some some fun facts about sure. your career? Probably the longest single case I worked on in the Attorney General's office, 18 years. Uh, Tahoe Sierra Preservation Council, and uh, it involved thousands of plaintiffs suing uh, the state of California, Nevada, and the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency for uh, alleged regulatory takings. Uh, uh, and we, we handled and litigated that case for 18 years, four trips to the Ninth Circuit, and went all the way to the Supreme Court. And after winning uh, our, our fourth and final Ninth Circuit case, uh, the, the plaintiff landowners uh, were successful in, in getting the Supreme Court to grant cert in that case. And uh, we thought, uh, well, it's not great news uh, uh, because as, as uh, uh, Claudia mentioned, and uh, Claudia Polsky mentioned, uh, you know, or, or maybe it was Tani Cantil Sakui, uh, courts generally don't, appellate courts don't take cases to, to sustain them. Um, Anyway, we thought we needed a Supreme Court expert, and uh, we went to uh, Washington, D.C. and rented a, a conference room at the Willard Hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue and basically auditioned a bunch of Supreme Court <laughs> experts uh, uh, to, to associate in and work with us on the case on the merits before the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, we wound up uh, 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 hiring uh, a then relatively obscure appellate specialist with Hogan and Hartson in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., that firm that was, had been nominated for a seat on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeal uh, that was waiting a confirmation hearings, and that was John Roberts. Uh, and so I got to be co-counsel with John Roberts, or I should say maybe he should got to be co-counsel with me. <laughs> uh, but but we, we, we prepared, we, we wrote the, 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 the merits brief together uh, with, in conjunction with a, a couple other co folks, including Clem Shute, who is representing uh, uh, TRPA, uh, and had John argue it, and he did a ma masterful job. I had seen him when he was in the Solicitor General's office and when I was on a fellowship program at the Supreme Court for four months in 1988, so I knew he was how good he was, and he did a marvelous job. Bottom line, we won that case uh, six to three, uh, uh, and a, a major precedent was established in, when it, in the law of regulatory taking. So, uh, Tahoe, Sierra Pre Tahoe Sierra Preservation Council versus TRPA, uh, as Yogi Berra put it, you can look it up. <laughs> so that, that was that was a long, grinding case, but that was that was one very satisfying. Uh, victory. More recently, as a law professor, I 
uh, did pro bono work on a public trust case mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, involving the Scott River, uh, and uh, we got a, a very favorable ruling from the, the Court of Appeal uh, in Sacramento that the public trust applies to groundwater, at least that groundwater that is uh, uh, hydrologically connected to surface waters. And that's another important, in my view, advancement of the public trust doctrine in California. The next step is to find the right case to, to, to get to California court and a published opinion saying that the public trust doctrine applies to all groundwater just as it, as it does to all surface water. So it seems like a no-brainer to me, but uh, more work to be done. But satisfying win uh, nonetheless. Well, we're approaching the close here, um, and I'm hoping we've asked all the right questions, but uh, uh, maybe we should give you a chance for a closing argument. Um, <laughs> you know, is, is there anything else you'd like? This is about you. This is an opportunity to recognize, you know, your tremendous work through your career. And again, you know, uh, I appreciate what a privilege it is to be up here and to have worked with you. Last thoughts, anything else you want to share with the group Well, last here? thoughts, I, I, I very much appreciate both of you taking the time uh, to, to do this. Uh, Matt uh, is, a, is an example uh, of my first adage of management, uh, that is to, to, to hire, uh, promote, uh, the, the, the people who are smarter and more talented than you. He's heard this story, and that's Matt Rodriguez. Yeah, He's no. had a stellar environmental career in his own right. Uh, and also to Shannon, who just embodies uh, the very best in the marvelously talented uh, law students that I've had the opportunity to work with and teach uh, and hopefully mentor. Uh, at the different schools I've worked at, most recently at uh, Berkeley Law and uh, in King Hall at, at UC Davis. So, so thank you both. Uh, and that, that's really, I think, exemplifies the quality of people I've been so blessed to work with in my fifth, nearly 50 years of, of practice and teaching. This was not the closing I had in mind. We were supposed to be talking about you, but Tough. I appreciate that. That's too bad. <laughs> but, uh, it's been a great ride. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to be given more direct response counsel, uh, uh, it, it's been a great ride. And uh, uh, just looking out in the audience, I mean, all of you, your, your friends, your, your colleagues, some of you are former clients, uh, uh, some are current academic colleagues, uh, and it's... It's just a, been a wonderful profession, uh, both professions, plural, environmental, being an environmental lawyer, being an environmental law professor, and uh, uh, being able to interact with, work with, and benefit from my uh, friendships and, and, and collaborations with so many uh, marvelous and extremely talented people. So thank you all. need uh, more time for the applause at the end. Yeah. That's true. A few more minutes for that. Well, there's always time for more applause. Um, we just wanted to say that as the sun has set on this beautiful place, we're so glad that all of you attended and submitted great questions, showed a lot of interest and respect for the Lifetime Achievement Award and for Rick. And so we really re uh, appreciate all of you attending tonight. We hope that you can go to the reception and then to the, to the uh, banquet after, where you will learn more about Rick from some of his colleagues. And Rick will make a few formal remarks there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter for the very final remark. <laughs> Just my, my final remark is just wow. Um, thank you, Matt and Shannon, for constructing such a thorough and engaging discussion. And of course, it wouldn't be thorough and engaging if not for Rick's contributions to the field of environmental law. So thank you. Thank Rick. you, Peter. Thank you, Marilyn. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah.